Uh, hey, it's been a little bit. Good to see you again. How you doing? <laughs> now look, I know that I've been using my Mac Studio and I've been kind of quiet about it. I've been showing some tests, but I really wanted to share with you today what I really think about it after using it for a month. I've also simultaneously been using my MacBook Pro M1 Max. Yes, I haven't completely switched over to the Mac Studio yet. And if you remember my video from maybe a month or two ago, no, it must have been two months ago, when the Apple event was announced, I made a little video where I thought I made a mistake by buying the MacBook Pro. But now, now I'm changing my mind again. Hey, I'm allowed to do that. I can change my mind. Why not? As long as I keep you updated. So like I said, I've been using it for about a month now. And uh, the one I have is the one with the M1 Ultra, not the one with the M1 Max chip. I thought, hey, might as well get the biggest one, right? And today I'm going to be comparing my $4,500 16-inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Max chip to see how it stacks up for some of my software development tasks, some of the real world things that I've been doing, and how does it compare to the Mac Studio with the M1 Ultra chip, and how those two machines compare as development machines for tools and frameworks and languages that I use, which by the way are Xcode, Android, JavaScript, Python, and .NET. And then I'll give you my overall thoughts on which one I recommend buying for programming specifically, and what spec upgrades I think are worth getting in each package. Now, speaking of specs, here are the specs for each of these machines. This is the M1 Ultra for $4,000. And obviously with the Mac Studio, you also need to get yourself a monitor, a keyboard and a mouse separately. So that's one of the immediate downsides of buying that machine. I already had all those things lying around, so I'm not factoring that into the price. But with the MacBook Pro, I've maxed out all the specs. So I got 10 core CPU, 32 cores GPU, 64 gigs of RAM, and two terabytes of SSD storage. Yeah, I, I know you can get more storage than that, but the rest of the specs I maxed out. The specs that I got on the Mac Studio are 20 core CPU, 48 core GPU, 64 gigs of RAM, and one terabyte of SSD storage, which was a mistake. I should have gotten the two terabyte one. I don't know, I just hit the button so quickly and I, hit the wrong one and now I can't get them for 12 weeks so I'll be using external storage that's for sure anyway so I did only a little bit of all the available upgrades on the M1 Ultra Mac Studio which is not even close to a fully maxed out model which could take you all the way up to eight thousand dollars if you do that and as I'll point out at the end some of those upgrades are even overkill for most of the developer machine specs that you need anyway first my overall thoughts about the functionality differences between the two now obviously a laptop is a lot more portable and versatile it has a screen built in and i've been using this macbook pro now as my main computer for the past few months and it's been really nice it's been nice to be able to just plug it into the external monitor and hard drives when i'm at my desk but also i could just pick it up and use it on my couch or in a coffee shop now that it's safe to go out outside again i'm afraid of people now and it still gives me the same amazing speed wherever I go. One small complaint about it would be that there really aren't a ton of ports on it. You only get three USB-C ports and one HDMI port and one SD card slot. This does get the job done, but I do find myself wanting more USB-C and at least one of the good old USB-A ports. Always have to use that dongle for the USB-A peripherals. By the way, as a side note, can I just say something about the different USB shapes? What the f*** is up with the USB-B? Companies Please stop using USB-B. We don't want you to come back. In case anybody's wondering, I'm talking about this guy right here. Useless. All right, sorry. I get a little heated up about all the different USB shapes. By the way, I finally learned how to properly insert USB-A the first time. There's a little logo on the top, so that always goes on top. Okay, little thing I learned. Now compare that with the Mac Studio Ultra. You have six total USB ports, two USB-A ports, nice. HDMI, 10 gig ethernet, and a card reader. So it really does feel a lot more pro of a machine to be used as a main workhorse machine versus the MacBook Pro feels a little bit more limiting. So really you've got ports versus portability. That's probably one of the biggest trade-offs between these two machines. And that just depends on which one is more important to you. I do however love how small and compact the Mac Studio is. And if you really wanted to, you probably could take this with you to a coffee shop. I tried this and it worked out just fine, especially when 
one compared to my old trusty iMac that I've been using as my main home machine for seven years. And by the way, if you really wanted to travel with the Mac Studio, you can. You can just throw that in a nice case and take it on the road with you, as long as you have access to a monitor wherever you're going. It's a pretty good on-the-go machine too. I also kind of really love the two USB-C ports and the card reader on the front. I really hated that about the iMac where I had to reach behind it all the time and I always had to look back there because I didn't know, you know. Anyway, a great design choice on the Mac Studio. So aside from the obvious physical differences that I've already mentioned, there are differences in the way the machines behave too. The Ultra has fans on continuously and it's always around 1300 RPM is what I've noticed. I use a little program called TG Pro to see the fan speed and temperature. And I can also control the fan speed with this program. By the way, there's a link to it down below for a free trial if you want it. Try it out. Even while building WebKit, pretty significant size project or running other code benchmarks, the Mac Studio barely budged its fan speed or its temperature for that matter. Now that's not to say that this machine is completely silent. It's quiet, but in a quiet room like I have here, which I need to have for recording audio. And it always gets ruined when I have an Intel machine in here. Anyway, in a quiet room like this, I can hear a persistent but gentle hum from the Mac Studio. This is in stark contrast to the MacBook Pro that I have and I'm looking at it right now, where even the highest spec SOC doesn't trigger the fan until I'm doing something significant, such as building code. Right now, this machine is sitting there and the fans are off, so it's completely silent. So if you're looking for consistency in the noise levels, the Mac Studio is great. But if you're looking for absolute silence, at least while you're not doing any heavy CPU loads, then the MacBook Pro is for you because while idling, the fans are completely stopped and they even continue to be stopped while having Chrome open and your editor while you're coding. But if you're looking for absolute silence all the time, then the MacBook Air is the one for you since it has no fans at all, but that's for another video. Now, on the other hand, during GPU intense work, my Mac Studio was making a weird cricket sound. This was rare, but you can see examples of this in my videos on Unity and machine learning. And since those videos, I've heard from many commenters that have had the same problem, some of which have mentioned that this is coil wine associated with the GPU. Doing the same exact tests on the MacBook Pro never produces strange sounds like this. So I found that for this machine, which could potentially go up to $8,000 if you max it out, these kinds of random noises are pretty unacceptable. And even though they're pretty rare, and I most likely won't hear them because I won't be doing any kind of machine learning on the Mac anyway. Those I will be doing on a PC. But for those doing game development, you might experience this if you have a similar model to mine and if Apple doesn't fix this. Now, on the performance side of things, the M1 Ultra was a bit of a letdown as it didn't really deliver to my expectations. My expectations were probably unrealistically high, but after the Apple event in March, the biggest excitement for me was seeing how the M1 Ultra was essentially two M1 Max chips fused together. And while in theory this would mean doubling the speed of some of my builds, in practice, this that really didn't turn out to be the case. For example, in my Xcode tests, the benchmark did quite well and so did the WebKit build. But when I tested building a real application that my team and I are building for a client, the results were less than spectacular. I did get slight benefit, but it wasn't really worth it, in my opinion. Android was similar result. The benchmark did do a slightly better, but uh, not that much better. And the same kind of result was with the Android version of the application that we're building. As you can see, the benefits aren't that huge. It is faster, just not that much faster. Now, where it did surprise me was single core tests because, well, you take one core from the M1 Max and one core from the M1 Ultra, theoretically, they're the same one type of core. So why did it do so much better in the speedometer tests, the web tests? I don't really know, but it did. Here are the results that I got for speedometer on both of those machines. And recently I even tried to convert this into a multi-core test by hacking speedometer. You can check the video out in the library. I still have yet to do the comparison on that one for the M1 Max. So if you wanna see that, subscribe to the channel. And by the way, thank you to the members that have recently joined. The join button is right down there next to the like button. I really appreciate your help and support for this channel and the videos that I make here. So thank you. Now, I also do work with Python and the Max Studio M1 Ultra did pretty well in the Python test. I have done tests with the M1 Pro and the M1, the old M1, but I actually haven't tested Python on the M1 Max yet. So if you want to see that video, let me know in the comments as well. Now, as far as machine learning, I did a TensorFlow test and the result was not that much better again. Now, 
I don't believe that TensorFlow is actually quite optimized yet to take full advantage of the neural engine and the neural cores in the M1 Ultra. So I think that this will be something that'll improve. It's just not quite there yet. We'll have to see what happens in uh, WWDC 2022 this year. We'll see if there's any new announcements about that. An important thing to keep in mind for all these tests is that it really depends on what software you're using and whether or not it's updated or optimized for the Ultra chip. A lot of progress has been made in the last Last year and a half and you can check the latest in compatibility for your software on sites like doesitarm.com and even though we're not quite fully there yet with compatibility across the board it's definitely moving that direction so basically even if you get the m1 max right now and skip the m1 ultra there's still going to be room for software to catch up to the hardware so you're gonna have a future-proof machine at least for a few years. So at this point, getting an M1 Ultra for software development is a bit overkill. Now, if you are doing other things along with software development, like 3D rendering, video encoding, then you'll see the biggest benefits to getting the M1 Ultra chip, even now. And the rest of us will just have to wait until more optimizations take place from software vendors. Now, as I mentioned recently, I made a video saying that I made a mistake in buying the M1 Max MacBook Pro, when a few months later, the Mac Studio came out but what i'm finding out is that i'm using my macbook pro way more often even at my desk when i come over and plug it into one of my monitors it's just better for continuity of work to be on one machine for me i think the portability of the laptop is a standout advantage for macbook pro although now that i do own the faster mac studio ultra it'll most likely become my main video editing workhorse hey he's talking about video editing i thought this wasn't the channel for that Yes, I do have videos on YouTube and I do occasional video editing, so there we go. As for the specs that I would recommend for software development, in the MacBook Pro variety, I would get the 16 inch just because it has more real estate for working. I would also get the M1 Max. The Pro is also a really good beast, but you definitely get more speed out of the Max. And I would also upgrade to 32 gigs of RAM, but at the minimum, 16 is a must these days. Don't, don't go for the eight, please don't do that. My machines are 64 gigs just for safety. And since I tend to run a lot of Adobe programs simultaneously, and I tend to use virtual machines quite a bit too now for the graphics cores unless you're doing game dev don't bother maxing that out at this point in time since the only developer populations that i know can take advantage of the heavy use of the gpu are going to be game developers and machine learning experts and the rest of you don't really need the extra gpu power and on top of that machine learning engineers will likely have a linux machine with a dedicated discrete graphic card anyway so there you go folks i hope this was helpful to some of you that are trying to make that last minute decision last minute well it's not last minute i mean you got time you you take your time make your decision okay no need to rush into this kind of thing there's new machines around the corner anyway all right folks i appreciate a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video subscribe to the channel and i'll see you in the next video